So welcome to my talk, Managing Secrets at Scale. Great that you made it uh, this afternoon to this talk. I am, yeah, I am Mark Paluch, and I work originally for the Spring Data team. So you might ask the question, OK, what do we do with data and vault and security? How does this fit together? Well, in April this year, I discovered vault, and I was so much excited, so we started uh, together with Spencer Gibb from the Spring Cloud team to work on that. And that's basically the reason why I'm here today. And I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about Vault today and what we can do with Spring for you with Vault. Well, when it comes to security, um, there are different approaches how, how you can really approach that. Most uh, known configuration systems um, are not that flexible and uh, do not really allow um, any, any security on, on configuration level. There are some, but uh, it's, it's quite hard to, to achieve that. And most of the time, you see configuration like that, that uh, you have uh, some snippet of XML, and you see plain text passwords, plain text usernames. You have property files uh, where you just uh, deal with um, plain text uh, passwords as well. And that's not, not cool. How many of you run systems using Docker? Oh, quite a few. Cool. Um, another aspect of security and secure services is um, distribution. The world currently tends to distribute systems, split up monoliths into, into multiple systems. And with the monolith, well, you have one big advantage because uh, your configuration lives at one place, usually. With uh, distributing systems to, to, uh, to Docker or PCF or uh, other uh, ways of uh, running uh, services, you basically duplicate all your configuration and distribute all that systems uh, to different places. So this is, again, something which does not quite feel right in, in terms of security. And we need to improve at that point. Well, um, when it comes to encryption, um, there are some distinct systems which uh, allow to encrypt um, data. This snippet is uh, taken from, from Tommy. Uh, Tommy is uh, um, basically the enterprise extension to, um, to Tomcat. And those guys allow you to encrypt um, certain parts of, of your configuration. This is quite nice because you no longer have uh, plain text uh, data inside of your configuration. But this brings a couple of uh, things you have to, to consider. First, you need to encrypt that data. So that's, uh, that's an additional step uh, inside uh, of your provisioning. So if, if you are going to um, uh, roll out a configuration, you have to make sure that you encrypt uh, the data first, and then you can uh, roll it out. Next, you have to deal with the decryption. So uh, encrypted data makes only sense to you if you are able to decrypt that. And this introduces another problem. You have to manage your uh, encryption decryption keys. If you are um, using uh, uh, symmetric encryption ciphers, then you have basically one key. And everybody who has this key uh, can, is able to encrypt data and decrypt that data. So that's probably well an idea with uh, limited uh, usability. If you have asymmetric ciphers, then you have uh, two keys, one for en en encryption, the other one for decryption. Well, that's a little bit of better, but still you have uh, to manage uh, the decryption key on, on the decryption side. So you have to store uh, the decryption key along with your application. And well, now, how do you do that? You can do that inside the code. Well, would work, but what if you change the encryption key? Well, you have to redeploy. You could place the uh, decryption key somewhere outside your application. So this would work. And you can then also change the key, and uh, you're on the safe side. But to be honest, putting the decryption key for, for data somewhere gives an attacker the possibility to use that encryption key. You do not know when somebody is accessing this uh, decryption key. and. Uh, at which time he, he uh, 
uh, got uh, in, into the knowledge of, of this uh, the decryption key. So um, you have very little control over that. And this, again, introduces some sort of uh, chicken and egg problem, because you, you have um, encrypted data, you need to decrypt it, you have to store that key somewhere, and this key is uh, basically the key to decrypt uh, all of your data. And if you encrypt all your data with this particular key, then uh, this unintended party has access to all of that data. So this is, again, not cool. So you have a chicken and egg problem. A possible solution could be that you store the key in a hard-to-guess path on your file system. That's possible. Uh, limit the, um, the, um, uh, the security settings on, on the key, so only the application user is able to, uh, to uh, read that key. And on startup, you read that key and delete it. So it's there for just a very short period of, uh, of time, and you limit the, the time frame. You're vulnerable with that. That's cool, until you restart. Um, because once you restart, uh, the key is no longer there, and your application is no longer able to, to um, come up back again, because you do not have the decryption key, and um, yeah, that's not a good idea. For all those who do not use virtualization techniques, there is another possibility how to, how to deal with that you can use hardware security modules uh, that you plug just into the, the server, and once your application is, uh, is up, you take, take that out, and the key never really touched uh, too much of the, your application, uh, because you just plug it in before, right before you start your application, take it with you when, you, when your application is uh, started, and that's it. Well, nice solution, but this does not work with virtualization, with Docker, with PCF, and all that modern cool techniques. So um, it's not cool either. And then, well, when you run a lot of instances, um, your ops team says, okay, well guys, let's change all the passwords. So you, you run again through the provisioning process, um, have to um, distribute the new passwords to all places. If you use en encryption, you have to again uh, encrypt that. And that's a situation which does not really make you, make you happy, but you just want to run away from, from that. And that's the reason we are talking today about Vault. Vault is a product from HashiCorp. Um, anybody here who does not know HashiCorp? HashiCorp is uh, basically the company which defines how DevOps is, uh, is seen. And uh, these are the guys uh, behind uh, Vagrant, and they run also a couple of other um, projects. Vault is a service uh, which um, tries to address some of these issues I mentioned today. There is no absolute security answer to all of that. Each, um, each approach has its uh, pros and, uh, and cons. And Vault uh, tries to at least address uh, issues with encryption, with uh, access to, to uh, credentials, and uh, the distribution of credentials. And what, what, what Vault basically does is, it is a service that manages the uh, secret part for you. So secrets are database uh, credentials, API keys, um, JWT token certificates, all that stuff that you do not really want to, to distribute uh, too much. Uh, but rather keep it in, in one place. So Vault provides you a secure storage module, uh, and Vault encrypts all the data for you. So you do not need to have a decryption and encryption uh, mo uh, module uh, in your, inside your application. And if you're a Java developer, you're perhaps ever aware of the limitations that you, uh, certain key sizes are not um, allowed by default unless you install uh, unlimited, key si uh, the unlimited key sizes extension. And um, encryption is hard. Yeah, you really have to, to set up the uh, right cipher using the right mode. Um, but you, to be honest, you do not want to deal with that. Uh, Vault follows a concept of sealing and unsealing. So if somebody uh, gets uh, in touch with, with your secrets and, and is able to compromise one, one of these secrets, you can sh uh, perform a global shutdown. So you 
just shut down your servers, the vault servers, they are then sealed, and nobody is no longer able to access that secret data. Well, this brings uh, the issue with it that uh, most of your servers won't be able to either start or uh, operate, but at least your security concerns are uh, addressed with, with that. Wall we'll also provides uh, multiple uh, authentication me mechanisms uh, to prove that uh, your application is that one which is uh, pr pretending to be. It also provides multiple secret backends, and what this means we will uh, go, uh, get there in a, in a second. But the more important part is that it provides uh, access control lists. So you do not longer have one key that is the master key to, to your whole system, but you can install uh, policies and say, this application is only allowed to uh, use this part of, of my secrets, and the other application is able to, to access an, another part. And so, so you have a fine-grained control over the visibility of secret and data uh, to, amongst your different applications. It provides an answer to high availability uh, operation mode uh, because you do not want to uh, be vault the single point of failure uh, and it exposes an HTTP API. Those folks uh, who've been uh, yesterday in Spencer Gibbs' uh, talk maybe have uh, seen already a little bit of uh, the HTTP API and we are going to see other bits in, in the demo. Vault comes uh, in two different editions. It has a community edition and an enterprise edition. And the community edition is very strong uh, uh, regarding its features. It brings you the uh, secret storage engine. It allows you uh, tokens and access po po policies. Uh, it deals with dynamic secrets, um, which, are, uh, which give you access then to different other services. It allows you to expire certain secrets so you have um, a time to live on, on them. Uh, you're able to re-encrypt your whole secure storage, and it provides you also with audit logs. So you see which service, which, which IP address, which user is accessing which tokens and which uh, secure data, so, are, so you're able to trace that down if you are um, compromised. The difference to the enterprise edition is that you get support and um, phone and email support and support for hardware security modules um, that um, bring you a couple of other interesting features. But let's stick to the community uh, edition for today, which is really strong. Well, how does it uh, look like uh, with Vault? Well, um, I'm going to start Vault and um, initialize Vault. For the initialization, uh, when you the f start Vault for the very first time, you need to initialize the secure storage. And um, this uh, display will bring you, uh, one, for one time, the master encryption key. So um, this key is then uh, the master to, to all the encrypted data, and you will be able to see it only once when setting, uh, setting this up. And the other uh, interesting thing here is um, Vault uh, has really security built inside, so it's not just pretending to be secure, but uh, also uh, the initialization procedure uh, is uh, uh, with security in mind. So you do not also want to have one single person uh, to be in charge of all your secrets, but rather you want to uh, distribute that, uh, that you have multiple um, people, multiple ops uh, in charge of, of the whole system. And so you, maybe you know it from, from, from all, all movies where in some area 51, there's one with a key, the other one with a key, and both turn, it, uh, turn keys. And that's the idea uh, Vault also picked up. And they picked it up in key shares. Uh, so the master key is divided in particular parts, which are then distributed um, amongst your operating team. And you specify upon initialization how many of these shares are required to unseal Vault. And unsealing Vault is bringing it back to operations. So let's, let's do that. So Vault server dash config equals Vault dot conf. So Vault is uh, written in Go and available uh, for multiple platforms. And what I did right now is I started Vault with a very simple configuration, and uh, it's running. 
it's running as a foreground process. So if you want to spawn it as, as daemon, you will um, have to, to um, do a little bit for, for that. And Vault, uh, the bi uh, Vault binary is, is a server and client uh, in one uh, binary. So you can use uh, the same binary to spawn up a server and use it also for, as a client. Now, um, Vault is the com uh, command also to, to, the, to the CLI. And let's uh, issue a status command to see what's going on. Okay, and it says server is not initialized. So let's do that. Vault, init, and here I can, can specify how many key shares I want to, to use. Key shares well, equals 10, and key threshold equals two, hopefully no typo. And uh, this means that I want to uh, divide my master key into 10, 10 shares, and I need at least two of those uh, to unseal vault. And now you see a lot of uh, output, and uh, what is ba it basically says is it uh, displays all the unsealed key shares, so that's, that's the, uh, the upper part, and it displays an initial root tokens. token. Tokens are the basic, uh, most, most, most basic um, unit of uh, security in, inside of Vault. So you use multiple uh, authentication me mechanisms, but each of those will provide you with, with a token. And uh, every time you access a Vault using the API, you have to provide that, that token. So first room for this, um, note down these keys, share them amongst your ops team, and make sure you don't lose them Otherwise, you won't be able to access your data. So uh, forgetting all of that is a guarantee to uh, well, start with Vault. And now, uh, once I have Vault uh, initialized, it's in a sealed state. So uh, the Vault status command uh, now does not come back with an with a error message, but says sealed is true. And what I have to do right now, I would just pick two random uh, keys, Vault unseal this one, it still says seals true. And the next one, vault, unseal, other key, and sealed is now, now false. And um, maybe you've no noticed uh, in the background the log has uh, continued and said, okay, post unseal, setup complete, and now uh, I am able to, to use vault. So uh, the next part is um, how to write data uh, inside uh, Vault to Vault and how to read uh, arbitrary data uh, to, uh, from Vault. And now I need to uh, use this root token. Usually you would not re re use the root token in production, but rather that's, that's something which is also uh, at a, a secret place. You would create uh, multiple tokens or users or using your LDAP um, or what, whatever you have in, in place to perform user authentication. And then you would uh, use these keys to, um, uh, to, to generate tokens and access data with these tokens. The thing is, um, tokens are organized in a, in a hierarchical way, and this um, comes uh, by, by design. So uh, if you see something suspicious on a, on, a, on a token level or user level, you basically are able to revoke that token and everything w which was created by this token is just locked down. And so you get this um, notion of um, removing and locking access to particular parts of your system without uh, tearing down your whole, whole system. The Vault CLI, uh, you can, uh, with the Vault CLI, you can either specify uh, the token on each uh, request or uh, take the convenient way, which is then exporting uh, the key as uh, environment variable. So that's uh, what I'm going to do to right now. Vault token is equals this. And now I can, can use the read and write commands. So Vault write secret A equals B, let's, let's do it with that. And it says uh, success data written to uh, secret hello world. And that's the same address uh, I can uh, also read right now. 
and it says, okay, it has a refresh interval. Um, we will come later to, to that. And it um, shows up the, the same keys I, I also uh, uh, set and, and, and used. You can use Vault as well using the HTTPA API. So that's uh, the thing the CLI is doing um, behind the scenes. Now I have um, issuing a curl command. Yeah, I have to uh, use the wrong path. Yeah, here we go. Um, and um, I'm, I'm curling the endpoint. Um, and that's, that's a, a type of response I am receiving. It's all JSON, it's all wrapped uh, inside uh, a generic response structure which gives you uh, some interesting uh, features when, when you want to secure uh, data even, even more than that. If, uh, if you want to just provide somebody with a one-time token to access uh, data. So that's uh, all possible with Vault. And you can also um, write data using the HTTP API, which is really, really convenient. So let's talk a little bit about secret backends. By, by default, uh, what you've seen right now uh, is the generic, so-called generic secret backend. And the generic secret backend is um, the type of thing uh, where you would put your static usernames, passwords, um, API keys, uh, if you have uh, some uh, SSL uh, certificates or, or private keys, that's the place for you to go. And, and uh, for most cases, you get to go with a, a generic secret backend. And uh, you can store arbitrary data inside of that uh, as long as you stick uh, to, to uh, the limitations of uh, JSON. So you're also fine to, um, to create hierarchical paths uh, where you could uh, organize it in, in folders, and inside of, of each of these context paths, you um, basically put in a JSON data structure. Besides of that, uh, Vault comes with different other secret uh, backends, and these uh, secret backends uh, do not really read like they would be used for storage. And indeed, guess what? That's true. Because you are able to, uh, to generate secrets using Vault. So, um, perhaps everybody of us uh, who, who deployed an application to production has gone through the process of applying for a database credential or uh, getting um, access data to um, uh, some messaging system and, and so on. And now comes Vault into place. Vault can do this for you and Vault can uh, generate um, AWS uh, access token and secret key. Uh, it can generate username and password for C uh, Cassandra, MySQL, and, and so on, uh, support for console. It has a built-in uh, public key infrastructure backend, which is able to generate certificates. And by generating, I mean uh, you ask Vault to go to your MySQL database, create a user for you, and return that. So uh, you're um, doing the ops jobs, uh, job at, at one um, point, but um, the other aspect of that is that each of these secrets is associated, or you can at least associate it with a time to live. And what this means is uh, that the generated credential will expire at a, at a particular time. So you can say, okay, well, my uh, username for uh, MySQL is only valid for one week, and after one week, I have to refresh that credential. And that's, uh, to be honest, uh, an issue to, to the uh, most processes I know today, because you go once to the ops team, and unless they change the server, uh, your username and, pass and password are, uh, tend to be static. Well, what do we get with Vault? We get uh, a limitation on, of distribution because we no longer need to put our credentials um, aside the, the application, but we can put it, uh, stick it in one place. Vault takes care of that and uh, keeps all the credentials in one place. You get encryption out of the box. Uh, all data stored inside of uh, Vault is AES um, encrypted with the GCM mode and a key length of 20, uh, 250, uh, 256 bits. 
So you do not uh, need to worry about that, and you do not uh, need uh, client side en en encryption and decryption. But the only thing you need to worry about is that, uh, well, it's, it's HTTP, and you would like to use most probably HTTPS, because otherwise the whole security story is like worthless. You get key rotation, because you can uh, re-encrypt the whole data inside of Vault. And each of uh, this, these secrets can be associated with the time to live. And it, uh, Vault takes care of the uh, expiry by, by itself. But why, wait, there are two other items which we want to tackle right now. We want, to, we want access control and we want to lock down uh, the access. And that's the other part I am going to ta talk about right now. See, um, you, you've seen all, all this token. And um, by putting the, uh, the token in plain text inside your configuration um, does not really make things better. Because uh, as soon as somebody has access to the uh, configuration or uh, to, to, to the uh, artifact, he's able to, to read out uh, that, that token and pretend to be a um, user, um, a valid, valid user into that. And um, that really does not solve uh, our problem. So how do you prove and authenticate that uh, your application is uh, the one which it pretends to be? Well, there are a couple of authentic authentication mechanisms. And you've seen uh, the token. And Vault uh, supports out of the box username password authentication, which uh, maintains uh, a local user and password table. It supports uh, LDAP authentication, so you are able to plug in into your enterprise uh, authentication system. As a developer, you, which is quite convenient, you can use uh, GitHub tokens. So for dev time, it's uh, really nice. It has support for multi-factor authentications. So uh, if you know the Yubico keys or all these guys, um, that's a thing you can do. You can also authenticate using TLS certificates, so uh, client certificates. So you're use, you should use SSL uh, by default. So um, using client certificates is something which comes nearly for free. And it supports app ID authentication. And app ID authentication is uh, actually an approach which is quite nice because it consists of two components, something you own and something you know. So the idea hereby is uh, that you have two hard to guess uh, items. And again, there's no perfect, uh, no perfect uh, security with that. Uh, you just raise the complexity to, um, uh, to just uh, be less vulnerable. And with AppID authentication, uh, you have uh, two, two components. You have, first, the app ID itself. It's usually some, something like, like a UID. You could also use uh, some, uh, some symbolic name, but uh, to be honest, that's something you can really um, try out and with using brute force. So usually your uh, operator would go uh, to uh, your configuration system, set up uh, an app ID, and hand it uh, to you. So that's something you would uh, integrate inside uh, of your application. So that's something you have. Then um, you, you store it inside of your application um, along your configuration. And if somebody uh, gets access to this, it's not really, not really that critical. Yeah, it's, it's bad, but uh, the, the, uh, the, that unintended party does not really gain access to, to Vault. Because now we get a second component. That's a user ID in, in, in App ID. So in order to use um, App ID authentication, uh, you need a user ID. And that's the part of something you know. And usually, uh, that would be something which is very specific to your, to your service and the ex execution environment where your service runs it. That could be something like a Docker container ID. That could be uh, something like a MAC address or a IP address. I'm aware of that, that these are not really uh, things that are hard to discover. But at, a, at that time uh, where you're um, deploying your application, um, you, you are able to limit um, the number of authentication attempts using these credentials, and you are also able to um, limit down basically the, the sources, so you, you specify an IP range. So that's something which just raises the bar. 
It's uh, not, not perfectly secure. So with um, the knowledge of the user ID, that's something usually your operator would uh, be able to determine. Um, he maps the user ID and app ID to, to a particular role. And uh, once this is done, uh, you start your application, deploy it, the application logs into Vault uh, using the app ID and the de determined user ID, and then you finally re re are able to, to get a token, and uh, then you use this token uh, throughout your application session until the next start uh, or uh, until the, you deploy a new application version. So that's the idea behind uh, app ID authentication. With AWS, you have uh, another um, possibility that's uh, a quite a young, young feature. Um, if you are using uh, AWS and um, EC2 instances, um, these instances have uh, an identity document, which is PKCS7 signed, and Vault uses basically AWS as a trusted party to make sure, okay, this uh, instance is up and running. And the, uh, the first use of uh, this identity document uh, is, gives uh, the user uh, or the, the application uh, a token, and as an application, you have to maintain a nonce, uh, so to really make sure that if somebody uh, comes uh, next, then the uh, authentication attempt, attempt to this instance just fails. Again, uh, nothing that is absolutely secure, but uh, it uh, makes uh, use of the security primitives and uh, follows the trust on first use pattern. Vault comes um, with uh, some, some production-grade security-free features. Like I mentioned, uh, you are able to set up auditing. You see who access, accessed when uh, data. It comes with built-in policies, so you are able to restrict data visibility, uh, data access. Um, you might have one application to write data inside of Vault, and other applications, which are just user applications, uh, are able only to read particular parts of, of that data. And you are able to um, set a token lease expiry, uh, which uh, gives you this, uh, the possibility to create tokens for, uh, for uh, arbitrary use cases, like uh, you have a new employee uh, or uh, you have a one-time application start. And what this does is uh, it expires the token after either a certain time or a certain amount of usages. So, um, for high security uh, scenarios, you, you might uh, generate credentials for, for a new employee, for a new user, give this token to, to somebody, and within of, uh, 10 days, uh, this guy is able to access the data exactly once, and on, uh, on, after this one user, the token expires, and this token then cannot be longer be used for uh, authentication to, towards Vault. So, by this, we get access control, and uh, we are able to lock down um, the access uh, within uh, using the built-in expiry and the sealing mechanisms. And now, I guess we are at a pretty good state uh, in comparison where we have been uh, at the beginning of the talk, because now we have something which seems reasonable to, to use. It's still not, not perfectly secret, but at least it makes... Um, it's really hard to somebody to, uh, to compromise your, your system. Well, how to operate? I, I mentioned it already, use uh, transport level security, otherwise your whole encryption story is well, worthless. Uh, it's uh, HTTP and plain HTTP is quite easy to, ca to capture. You should really make sure that your unsealed keys are safely stored and you do not lose them. If you lose them, then you lose everything that's stored inside of Vault. And operate Vault, please, in a high availability mode to um, omit the uh, single point of failure issue. Well, and now comes the spring part in. Uh, we started uh, quite a while ago with uh, Spring Cloud on developing uh, an integration for, for Vault. And what, what we basically did is um, the integration uh, of Vault lives in the incubator project. That's, that's something uh, we try out with uh, new projects uh, which are not quite ready for production. There we have the chance to, to uh, evolve, to uh, develop uh, particular parts. 
and uh, get also some, some feedback without uh, the need of uh, really being uh, production ready because that's something uh, which evolves over time and grows over time. So we are able to, to learn from, from that. And with Spring Cloud Vault Config, we created quite a, a couple of components. And let me show uh, you how this would r uh, work right now. So let me set up the demo. So the first thing you would do is um, starting with a, with a blank project. So StartSpring.io is uh, quite a good uh, source for that. And for my demo right now, I, I will take the web part, the actuator part, to be able to, to get some, some insight. Now we generate a project. Okay, here we go. And the thing you need in order to integrate with Vault is adding the Vault starter. So that's the uh, dependency uh, in order to use the generic secret backend. And the second thing you need to provide to, to your application is uh, a bootstrap properties configuration because all that configuration part is uh, loaded up front before your application starts. So if we were to put that into application properties, um, certain parts would load uh, before we, will, we are able to, to load, the, load the vault component. And we will want to provide these components with vault configuration, not the other way around. So that's the reason I need the bootstrap properties. That's the first part. And the other part is um, I need to identify somehow to, to vault um, who I am and which parts I want to access. And what we did is uh, we took the Spring application name as identifier. Uh, let's take, say it's my Spring Boot app. This is the first one. And for demo purposes, I'm going to use um, the uh, root token. I should have it somewhere around. Oop. So uh, I started uh, Vault in demo mode. So that's a, a very convenient way to provide a uh, fixed token, which is quite handy for uh, development purposes. And now Spring Cloud Vault token equals this one. So, I guess we are done. So now let's start the application. It will take some while until it's, it's launched. And now we take a look. Oh, look, we have entries with Vault inside of here. And to uh, what, what we basically do uh, with Spring Cloud Vault config is uh, we have um, different approaches to obtain the configuration. See, uh, Spring applications uh, are able to use profiles. They uh, need um, sometimes uh, to have uh, application-specific con configuration, uh, which are specific to particular application parts. So that's why the application name comes in. And sometimes you have also um, use cases where you pro want to provide uh, particular properties to all your applications, and we support that on different levels. So if I start now the application with a, with a different profile, so notice this part, uh, which says secret my Spring Boot app, which reflects the application name. And if I now start with, a, uh, with profiles, let's say test A, B, oops, and C. And let's restart the application again. Then you, will see, you see, uh, that, um, see that we have additional property sources. These property sources have a particular order. So uh, the last uh, specified profile comes first. So that's the most specific part. And from that on, uh, we get less specific. So if you, if you have a um, property defined in your most specific profile, that's a prof property which is uh, going to be used inside uh, of the application. And if you have then a property that comes later, um, that's not going to make it. 
So uh, you have uh, to, to keep in mind uh, the property order. So that's one thing uh, we can do for you with uh, Vault and, and Spring. And the other part is uh, we also build integrations for uh, using Vault with, with um, different, um, different services. So as you might know, uh, Spring Boot has a pretty nice support for uh, MySQL, for PostgreSQL, so, so SQL databases. We have support for Cassandra. We have support for RabbitMQ. And that's something uh, we also build in inside of um, Spring Cloud Vault. So what, what I did right now here, I prepared an example, and I dis disabled the generic uh, backend. And I enabled basically the MySQL uh, module, um, specified a role, and specified a data source URL. Uh, and beforehand, I also configured Vault to, uh, to um, well, basically, did I, did I do that? Uh, not sure. Um, I guess I changed my, my demo, so I need to, to do that uh, again. So, sorry for that. Um, in order to, to generate uh, MySQL backend, uh, and, um, uh, credentials, I have to enable the MySQL, MySQL backend, so that's disabled by default. And then I need to provide um, two things to, to, to Vault. The first thing is um, saying, telling Vault, okay, where does my um, MySQL server live, and what are the uh, credentials? Uh, to that, that's the connection URL part. So Vault is then able to generate users uh, using this uh, connection details. Let's take that. And the other part is I need a role definition, and a role basically defines uh, what is um, what, which permissions do the the generated users have uh, for for this particular part, and that's the thing you would use to segregate between different different applications. So if you have uh, multiple uh, databases on, on your MySQL server and uh, the, they are used by multiple applications, so you would like to create most probably different roles per application. And here in this part, you need to specify the create user um, and grant statements. And I did uh, grant all, which uh, boils down to, well, do whatever you want. So now we are done with the setup, setup part. And to um, now use that, uh, we can we can uh, do a short demo on, on the console to obtain credentials for MySQL. Let's do that. Vault read MySQL creds read only. Whoop. Yeah, oh, sorry, typo. Okay, great. So now um, what I've uh, received is uh, a res response from Vault uh, containing a username and, and a password. And um, I can uh, use these two to connect to my uh, MySQL server. So let's do that. MySQL minus, minus u token something. That's the username and password. P. And then here you go. So we are now in, inside of uh, MySQL. And to show you that uh, the password is not just fake, I will delete uh, some, uh, some uh, letters. And then you see, OK, access denied. So that works, at least in a console. And if I uh, then continue inside of my uh, Spring application, which has only the data source URL uh, specified, um, I can, can do so by enab enabling the uh, MySQL uh, module inside Spring Cloud Vault. Start my application, and what this application is going to do, it, it will print uh, the current username. So let's wait for that. Ah, here we go. And uh, you're then able to use uh, these credentials inside of your application. But it's pre pretty nice because it integrates seamlessly with your Spring Boot application. You do not have to take further action unless you want to do so. And you can configure uh, the names of the properties. They default to, to the boot uh, standard uh, properties. And that works for uh, console, for uh, all the JDBC databases, uh, for Cassandra, for RabbitMQ. And we have one other additional module. And that's something perhaps you have heard of Let's Encrypt. Who has? Quite a few. OK, great. Well. Um, 
Let's Encrypt is great for, for the cloud and for public services, but in, inside of companies, you most probably don't want to use Let's Encrypt. You have most probably an own certificate uh, authority, authority some, some ops guys uh, creating certificates for you, and then they hand the certificates to you over, and you are then in charge to integrate that with your Spring Boot application. Well, um, somebody used key tool, that's no fun. And uh, it's even less fun because uh, these certificates tend to expire, but that's the nature of uh, certificates. And once you have did uh, this this year, uh, you have totally forgotten it uh, for uh, in two years when, when it expires, and that's not cool. And uh, we thought, okay, let's take advantage of the um, PKI backend, which is, um, part for, for Vault, and this thing is able to generate SSL certificates on demand. And what this means is you go to Vault, uh, specify your, um, your name uh, under which the server is, is known, uh, enable the PKI backend, so that's it for, for the bootstrap property, properties part, really hard, I have to admit and uh, enable um, SSL inside of your Spring Boot application. And once you start the, this application, then, um, well, it takes a while, and after the application is then, then, then started, I take HTTPS localhost 8443. Hey, look, nice, I have a certificate. And guess what, the cer certificate is valid, and it's my, uh, my, my certificate which was uh, generated. So is it right now 1706? Yeah, right. Um, and what I, what I did here is I created a CA locally. I uh, uploaded the intermediate certificate to, to Vault. Uh, you do not want to store your root CA inside of Vault. Vault, after all, is still a service and can be compromised, so uh, revoking a whole CA is uh, something you do, do not want to experience. Uh, revoking intermediate certificates is, well, okay, after all. And that's something you can uh, already do uh, with our experimental, experimental support for uh, SSL certificates. We have still uh, a way to go, so we are not quite there yet where we would like to be. Uh, but these are uh, the possibilities uh, the, uh, which are brought by, um, by Vault uh, to, to you. So yeah, we have seen, seen that. You can use this extension right now. Um, your, uh, every, everything you've seen today is available uh, in, uh, on GitHub. You will, uh, get, uh, we will get to, to the links in, in a minute. Um, everything you've seen all, uh, now is also available as snapshot. And uh, it just uh, requires you to add the uh, Spring I.O. snapshots uh, repository to, to your uh, project, whether, no matter whether it's Gradle or, or Maven, adding the Spring Cloud Vault starter config, which brings all of the dependencies for you, and there you go. So um, I will publish uh, the, the slides on, on Speaker Deck uh, once we are done with the, uh, with the talk. Uh, you can um, also access the uh, examples repository where we have set up um, the MySQL uh, example, we have set up uh, generic uh, authentication examples, um, we have set up app ID authentication. You can also plug in um, own authentication mechanisms uh, regarding the user ID part in app ID authentication because that's something which, which is really specific to your own needs and we didn't want to um, to limit you uh, to specific patterns. And if you're interested uh, in further uh, reading on Vault, just go to vaultproject.io. And as I said, springs will, uh, the, the slides will follow uh, then right after the talk. So glad that you've um, attended my, my talk. And now we have uh, a couple of minutes left uh, for uh, questions, I guess. So yes, please. Okay, the question was, how does it uh, integrate with the Spring Cloud Config Server? So that's a good question. Um, well, Spring Cloud Config Server uh, is stores uh, data inside of, of Git, uh, usually. 
And we have two, two different approaches you, you can then take. The one is um, you use Spring Cloud Config aside with Spring Cloud Vault. So you store your uh, public uh, configuration data inside of Spring Cloud Config and uh, the sensitive data part inside of Spring Cloud, uh, inside of Vault and use both components um, at once in, in your application. So that's one approach. The other approach is um, Spring Cloud Config has a environment repository abstraction, uh, which is basically the interface to, to all the storage providers. And what we have also in, um, inside of, of a, I guess a, it's, a, it's a branch, and it's a ongoing progress. Uh, we have an integration uh, with the Spring Cloud Config Server into Vault that uses Vault then as storage of, of data. You sacrifice some uh, properties uh, which are brought by Git uh, and, and the uh, Git integration, but you have uh, stored all of your uh, data inside of uh, Vault, and the w only one thing is you on, on the client side is uh, the client component for, for Vault. Makes that sense? Yeah, yes, question. Um, you're talking about integration with all these different services like MySQL and Rabbit and that. Does that mean that you're giving Vault credentials that allow you to create accounts in those backend services? How are, how are you negotiating that? Like, how are you making sure that that, are you adding that username and password to Vault as well and securing it that way? Or? Okay, so the question was, um, when integrating with uh, other services like MySQL, uh, you need to, to pass on credentials inside uh, to, to Vault. And the question is, yes, we have to uh, pass in credentials inside to Vault. These are stored securely. Uh, Vault encrypts it the same way as it would do uh, with the generic secrets, so there's no, no difference. And you have to provide it uh, once uh, uh, every, every uh, time you change uh, the config. Or, or the credentials to, 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 to your database. So that's something uh, which you would most probably change regularly, but that's a, a task for, for the ops team. Uh, and uh, you have to, to create, uh, create uh, provide quite strong credentials uh, in, uh, to, to Vault because uh, Vault will create users for, for you then. Yes, question. Does Vault in any way those credentials or secrets? Uh, pardon, I didn't get to... Uh, okay, the, the question is uh, whether there is a, a version in, inside of Vault, and the answer is no. Yes? So the dynamically generated users for MySQL, the other modules, if you have a TTL find out those, will they expire in the source as well, or just expire the access to them? Okay, so the question is, um, when using a TTL on generated credentials, uh, do they expire um, in, inside the source, or uh, how is it done? Okay, well, um, that's one of the more difficult to solve uh, issues because um, there are very different um, approaches the particular services implement. There are, uh, for instance, databases which uh, really check on every uh, access whether the user is revoked, even though a connection might persist for quite a, a long time. Other databases and services just authenticate uh, the connection once and uh, then you're uh, just good to go for, for almost uh, all the time. And that's where complexity kicks in. For uh, the JDPC part, I think we are able to reconfigure uh, the uh, connection pool and once uh, a connection uh, just expires or uh, is then um, just, just closed and, and a new one is uh, open, it will use then the new credentials. But to be honest, um, I wouldn't apply YOLO to, to that, uh, and I wouldn't uh, like to, to, to be the first guy who uh, do, does this in production. So that's maybe something you want to shift to maintenance periods, so uh, you restart your application uh, once every, every week or something like that, because that's really tricky and you don't want to be uh, vault cause causing that, uh, that issues. Not sure whether I understood this correctly. Let me rephrase it. So, uh, when revoking uh, credentials, um, how does does it happen? In, those back -end services, In this right? backend service. Okay. 
So Vault uh, is, uh, well, there are two approaches uh, to, to that. Um, in, it also depends on, on, on the service. Um, Postgres, for instance, has uh, a built-in uh, feature for uh, expiry of, of grants, and that's used uh, inside of, um, uh, of the Postgres integration. And for services like MySQL, uh, Vault uh, sees, okay, this uh, username and uh, username uh, has expired and goes to the database and just removes the user once the um, time to live uh, has expired. So there are uh, two, uh, two attributes. Um, one is uh, the real time to live, and one is uh, when, when the cleanup is performed, so you can control this individually. Okay, so, so the question was uh, how uh, to deal with uh, multiple servers and multiple connection URLs. Uh, the answer is quite simple. Um, by default, uh, what you've seen in the, in the demo is I mounted uh, just uh, the MySQL backend without any further parameters. Um, and by default, it uh, mounts to, to the path uh, slash my, MySQL. Uh, what you can do uh, is uh, specifying um, when creating the mount, uh, different context paths, and each context, context path matches to one particular uh, MySQL installation or, or endpoint. And uh, if you mount this MySQL module multiple times, you are able to um, design something like, like multi-tenancy, and then you ask uh, using different context paths uh, vault to generate credentials. And that's also uh, the approach uh, the other backends do for Cassandra, for the PKI backend, uh, and the other uh, service backends. Is there any samples online around how to do that? I'm not sure, but um, uh, the CLI is quite powerful on, on that. Um, let me just improvise. Um, vault mount dash dash help. Let's see what, what this says. Okay, and uh, what you would uh, need to do is uh, type in vault mount mysql dash path is well server to some, something like that. Does it? Yeah. So that, that would be something uh, you would uh, have to use. Okay. Then, if there are no other, oh, okay. So, so last question then. So you would show uh, basically getting a SSL cert into that container from Vault so that you could serve SSL, like you're showing it still now. So if you, are you able to modify the trust score with like a root CA so you can call another service? So the question was um, whether it's possible to uh, modify the trust store and key store. And yes, it is. Uh, you can uh, specify th those as, as properties. Um, everything is uh, documented so far, uh, how, how you would uh, do, do that. Um, and you can use, um, as, well, as soon as you start using uh, a client like H, uh, Apache HTTP, HTTP or uh, OK HTTP, uh, then you are able to do so with the configuration. Um, because we apply that configuration at, at runtime, and if you are uh, if you do not have any of these clients on your class path, we are basically falling falling back to the HTTP URL connection. And this guy has to be configured outside, so you would have to set that uh, using uh, system properties. But uh, when you're using um, dedicated clients, uh, you're good to go. Okay, great. So let me conclude the session. Thanks for um, for your time and um, have a great spring one.